Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode number 228, 1917, part one. Last time, we finished our tour of the old cities of Russia. Today, we start a five-part series on the most tumultuous and important year in Russian history, 1917. 1917 was a turbulent year all over the world. In this series, I'll be going back and forth between the events in Russia, focusing on Petrograd, also known as St. Petersburg, and the rest of the world. It will give us a framework with which to understand what was happening in Russia. My sources will include my extensive library, but there is one book I will be leaning heavily on. It's called Caught in the Revolution by Helen Rappaport. It is an amazing work, which includes first-hand accounts of the events of 1917 from numerous sources. This book, and I hope this series, will give you a sense of the fear, excitement, terror, and confusion that permeated the streets of Petrograd. Before we start, I have to point out a problem that has plagued many historians of this era. There were two calendars in use at the time, the Julian, or Old Calendar in Russia, and the Gregorian in the most of the rest of the world. I'll be using both as I have in most of my past episodes. Many of the correspondence that Rappaport uses in her work are from Europe and America, where the Gregorian dating system was the standard. I'll make sure that I keep you informed as to which dating system I'm talking about. To that end, the beginning of the end for the Romanov dynasty in 1917 was triggered by the February Revolution, and in particular, February 23rd Old Calendar, which was March 8th in the Gregorian calendar. When I get to that part, I will use the Russian calendar. So let's orient ourselves by putting us in the world on January 1st, 1917. World War I is raging all over Europe with no end in sight. In Russia, voices expressing the growing discontent is becoming louder and louder throughout the country. Hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers are dead, with the estimated death toll by the end of the war reaching 1.8 million. In January 1917, the United States Army, led by General Pershing, is chasing Pancho Villa in northern Mexico. They also purchased what was then known as the Dutch West Indies for $25 million, renaming it the U.S. Virgin Islands. And President Woodrow Wilson calls for peace without victory in Germany. The U-boat campaign was in full swing, with a million tons of Allied shipping being sunk that month. In Russia, the rumor will was going full blazes as Rasputin had just been killed on December 30th, 1916. Food was beginning to become scarce as 15 million men who would normally harvest grains were off at war. Petrograd was in a very bad way as grain and fuel were almost non-existent. Everyone was on edge. Throughout the months of January and February, the rumblings grew louder and louder. As Rappaport puts it in her headline for her prologue, quote, the air is thick with talk of catastrophe. Not only was the city crowded with its regular inhabitants, but it was also filled with thousands of refugees who left their homes on the eastern front of the war. Among the people who lived there at that time were my grandparents. My grandmother told of horrible times back then, keeping much of it quiet as it was a traumatic period for her and her husband. He would die after the war in Yugoslavia, from passing a kidney stone while defusing a hand grenade. British ambassador to Russia, Sir George William Buchanan, was a close friend of Tsar Nicholas who warned him that revolution was in the air and that creating a constitutional monarchy could save his throne. Nicholas dismissed his warning, claiming he was exaggerating the threat. Instead of listening to the rumors of discontent, Nicholas doubled down on his autocratic mindset by appointing Alexander Protopopov as his new minister of the interior. 
This friend of the now deceased Rasputin was so reactionary that many of the other ministers in the government resigned in protest. The local foreign embassies were getting deluged with the hungry and did the best they could. Supplies for them were even getting tougher to get because of the U-boat campaign. The only safe way to get to Petrograd was via Japan to Siberia and then hopping on the Trans-Siberian Railway. The hospitals were being overwhelmed by the wounded men from the front. One poignant story written about by Rappaport talks about the double-leg amputee lying in a hospital bed. He was visited by an old man who, upon seeing his son, began to yell at him. Enid Stoker, an English Voluntary Aid Detachment nurse, or what they called VAD, was aghast at what the translator told her the father was saying. Quote, why hadn't he died? Then they would have had gotten a small pension for him. Now look at him, a hopeless burden. How could he work the farm now? Just another useless mouth to feed, and they were already starving. Lady Sybil Gray, a Canadian aristocrat, recounted in her diary about some of the conditions. Quote, The sun doesn't shine like in Canada. If people like us really get our rooms above 50 degrees, what must it be for the poor? January 1st, 1917 was a particularly brutally cold day. This would continue for the coming months and would add to the misery of the people of Petrograd. While many in the ambassador court of the Tsar were convinced that no revolution could occur until after the war was concluded, French ambassador Maurice Paleologue was of the opposite opinion. In a letter to the French president, he wrote, quote, A revolution crisis is at hand in Russia. Every day the Russian nation is more indifferent towards the war, and the spirit of anarchy is spreading among all classes and even in the army. He further warned that, quote, the authorities cannot count on the army. British Ambassador Sir George Buchanan wrote the trouble, quote, if it comes, will be due to economic rather than political causes. Furthermore, it would begin, quote, not with the workmen in the factories, but with the crowds waiting in the cold and snow outside the provision shops. Due to transportation issues, Less and less flour was making it into Petrograd. By early February, less than one-sixth of daily shipments were making it into the city. Black bread, the staple of the poor, was being diverted to feeding horses. A rumor spread throughout the city that, quote, millions of pounds of cheap Siberian beef are being left to rot in railway sidings. On January 19th, Officials announced that bread rationing would begin. One pound per person was the allotment allowed. Fuel was so scarce that people would head into cemeteries at night and gather the wooden crosses to chop up and use to light their fires. This was followed by a series of strikes of major factories and industry throughout the city. Protopopov, in his ultimate wisdom as the Minister of Interior, decided that instead of trying to solve the food and fuel shortage, he would prepare for insurrection by secretly placing machine guns on the roofs of major buildings, especially along the main street, the Nevsky Prospect. This was to be a major disaster in the coming weeks. We're now into the month of February. The United States severed diplomatic relations with Germany, and Mata Hari was arrested in Paris for spying for the Germans. On February 24th, Walter Heinz Page, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom, is shown the intercepted Zimmerman telegram, in which Germany offers to give the American Southwest back to Mexico, if Mexico would take sides with Germany, in the case the United States would declare war on her. Russia was still in turmoil. People were starving. Soldiers were dying in the war and the government was doing little to help out. Desertions from the army was at an all-time high, and even more refugees were filling every room and every house in Petrograd. 
from here on for a bit, I'm going to revert to the Julian calendar to describe the day-to-day events that unfolded in late February that caused the collapse of the Romanovs. On February 9th, J. Butler Wright, an American diplomat, wrote the following about the mood in the capital. Quote, The Cossacks are again patrolling the city on account of threatened strikes. For the women are beginning to rebel at standing in bread lines from 5 a.m. for shops that open at 10 a.m. and that in weather 25 degrees below zero. There was an air of insurrection in Petrograd, so 14,000 Cossacks were moved into the city. They were reservists as the regular army was on the front lines against the Germans and their allies. There were sporadic strikes going on with the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and other political agitators spurring the people on. Tsar Nicholas had been assured by Protopopov that he had everything under control. The Tsar went off to army headquarters 500 miles away from Petrograd. The interior minister was fooling himself if he really truly believed that. Some of the foreign observers write about the mood of the people going from stoicism to anger, from frustration to rage. Windows of bakeries and milk shops were broken. And as Helen Rappaport put it in her book, quote, people on the streets were nervous, jumpy, staring at shadows, waiting for they knew not what. An American war photographer noticed on February 23rd that there were machine gun nests on rooftops that sprung up overnight. His Russian translator, a boy named Boris, told him, quote, we are going to have a revolution in Russia. He went to a telegraph office to send a message to his wife, but was told that it was a waste as the government wasn't allowing any messages to be sent out of the city. A parade of women was gathering at the Field of Mars in the heart of Petrograd. It was International Women's Day. Hundreds of women began the march, heading toward the Nevsky Prospect and the Latini Bridge. Many carried banners with slogans like, Increase rations! Hail women fighters for freedom! And a place for women in the Constituent Assembly! As they continued on, They were joined by more radical women from a number of major manufacturers that had just gone on strike. By noon of the 23rd, there was an estimated 50,000 people who made it to the bridge. They were met by a large contingency of police blocking the way. Some went down to the frozen river to make it across. Some went to the Troitsky Bridge, where there was a smaller group of policemen that couldn't hold back the crowd. Photographer Donald Thompson and Canadian reporter Florence Harper were in the crowd that day. Thompson noticed that a man waving a large red flag was next to them, making them sitting ducks as targets. He told Harper that this was, quote, no place for an innocent boy from Kansas, and bullets have a way of hitting innocent bystanders, so let's beat it while the going is good. The estimates of the number of workers in Petrograd who were suffering from hunger was estimated to be around 500,000. To top it off, fuel was low, there was heavy snow falling almost every day, and a lack of jobs. The government had no plan to resolve any of these issues. Robert Wilton, a Times special correspondent, commented, quote, Here was a patent confession of laxity. Whom was it expected to satisfy? The socialists who had already made up their minds for revolution? Or the dissatisfied man in the street that did not want revolution, but pined for some relief from an incapable government? On the streets, the mass, now numbering 90,000, were singing the French song of revolution, the Marseillaise, in Russian, of course. Thompson wrote, quote, The singing by this time had become a deep roar, and it was terrifying, and at the same time, fascinating. Cossacks who were called in to quell the protest were actually moving around on their horses as though they were on the side of the protesters. 
By 7 p.m., things were beginning to wind down until the special mounted police arrived to break up the remaining crowds. American journalist Arnaud Dochefleureau wrote, quote, Their appearance wiped the smile away, and when they began really roughing the crowd with their sabers drawn, the first murmuring of the snarl, which only an infuriated mob can produce, was heard. By 11 p.m., the streets of the industrial district were abuzz with activity. Many grocery store windows were being broken and bakeries were being ransacked. As Rappaport writes, quote, Revolution, so long talked of, dreaded, fought against, planned for, longed for, died for, had come at last. Like a thief in the night, none expecting it, none recognizing it. February 24th saw a rise in temperatures, both in the weather and the disposition of the people. Sergei Semyonovich Kabalov, commander of the Petrograd Military District, announced that, quote, all gatherings on the streets are absolutely forbidden. Of course, that was completely ignored as tens of thousands of people from the industrial district, armed with bolts, screws, rocks, even lumps of ice were out smashing any shop that was in their way. Cossack soldiers, when ordered to charge the crowds, refused. Bert Hall, a U.S. aviator attached to the Russian Air Service, said the following, quote, The common people are hungry. They've been hungry for a long while. Christ, why doesn't the Tsar do something about it? What a chance for some wise American organizer. Think of it. All of Russia might go to pot for the want of a little wise management. If there was ever an example of the lack of competence of the Tsar and his ministers, this was it. The people needed to be fed, and the revolution could be halted right then and there. While all of this was going on, nobody outside of Petrograd knew what was happening. The military had put a clamp down on any telegraphs and letters leaving the city. There was a tension in the air that was thick with fear, anticipation, and wonder. What was going to happen next? On Saturday, February 25th, the streets were filled with police. A general strike was called and no factory was operating. Foreign embassies were told not to allow anyone to leave their buildings. By noon, things were beginning to show signs of mayhem. A commanding officer of the police tried to charge into the crowd by the Latini Bridge. He was surrounded, had his gun taken from him. The man with the gun shot the officer dead, while another man beat him with a piece of wood. This was the beginning of a day filled with violence. The called for strike grew by the minute. Nothing was moving. Nothing was being produced. No one was doing anything but gathering in the streets in protest. Everyone was headed to the Nevsky Prospect. The crowd size was estimated to be around 300,000. I can only imagine the fear the people who lived on the street were feeling. My grandparents lived on the Nevsky Prospect that day, so this has a personal meaning. Troops were lining the streets along with Cossacks on horseback. None seemed to want to engage the crowd, as many of them sympathized with the protesters. But they were now ordered to break up the crowd. The policemen were willing to attack the mob with their sabers, but many of the Cossacks and army troops hung back. But the police, they were manning the machine guns on rooftops and balconies. Around 2 p.m., a well-dressed man was savagely attacked by protesters and beaten to death. This, as Thompson writes, quote, seemed to give the mob a taste for blood. Harper and Thompson were following the crowd when they heard a loud explosion. Someone had thrown a hand grenade at the people. Then a group of police on horseback charged at the crowd. They were met by a Cossack who put a lance into the chest of the leading officer. 
The rest of the Cossacks on the street raced toward the police, driving them off. The people were ecstatic. One American witness wrote, quote, You should have seen the crowd. People kissed and hugged the Cossacks, climbing on their horses to reach them. Others kissed and embraced the horses, the Cossacks' boots, stirrups, saddles. They were given cigarettes, money, cigar cases, gloves, anything, everything. Boris, the young Russian interpreter with Thompson, said, quote, The Cossacks are with the people. It was the first time in the history of Russia that a Cossack disobeyed orders. A patisserie named Pekars was now the target of the peaches, of the people. They had a display of fancy cakes and biscuits, and the mob smashed the window and began to take whatever they could. This is when the police began to fire on the crowd. At 2 a.m. on the 26th, Thompson and Boris came upon a group of about 60 people, and much to their shock, they had the heads of two policemen on poles leading down the street. All through the night of the 25th and the early morning hours of the 26th, hundreds of policemen were attacked, many killed, numerous seriously injured. The mob had gone into full riot mode, and they were not going to be easily contained. General Kabilov had ordered everyone off the streets and that any man who did not re return to work by Tuesday, the 28th, would be sent straight to the front lines of the war. He had 30,000 troops under his command, and he assured the Council of Ministers that he had everything under control and that he would squash the insurrection without mercy. He was, as you will find out in the next episode, sorely mistaken. Before I end today's episode, I want to share something that uh, I learned about a week ago from my brother about how our family came to the United States from Germany. There were two people who signed uh, the papers to recommend us and, and to guarantee that we would be okay to come to the United States. The first person I knew, uh, that was Igor Sikorsky. Yes, that Igor Sikorsky with the helicopter people. The second uh, came as kind of a surprise to me, and it was a woman named Florence uh, Belazelsky. Belazelsky. She was married to uh, Sergei Sergeyevich, and he was the son of Sergei Belazelsky Belazersky, who was the uh, Aide de camp to Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich Romanov uh, from about 1908 until about 1913. Uh, he was also a, uh, a Dragoon uh, Regiment commander. Uh, turns out that Sergei Belozelsky Belozersky's best friend was my grandfather, Andre. And Andre also worked under uh, the uh, Grand Duke. And they were best friends. And this is why my family was able to make it to the United States in 1953, because of these two people. Uh, Florence is an interesting character herself. Uh, her name was uh, Florence Crane at birth. And if anybody has ever heard of the Crane Company, a very large corporation that used to produce a lot of different products, she was a daughter of a, a very wealthy family. And it was nice to hear that these people had enough faith in my family, especially because of my mother and her uh, father, that they could come to the United States. So that's my little story. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about Russian history though not passionate about uh, what's going on in Russia right now. So anyways, join me next time when we return to the 26th of February, 1917, when all hell would break loose and Tsar Nicholas II, the last Romanov ruler, would be forced to abdicate the throne. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Until next time, 
До свидания и спасибо большое.